Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, we're going to circle back now on magazine bans. In particular, we're going to circle back to the case of Duncan v. Bonta. Now, as we know, the Ninth Circuit has accepted this en banc. They will certainly be ruling to undo what Judge Benitez has done not once but twice now. And lo and behold, along comes an amicus brief from multiple attorneys general, I got it right that time, attorneys general from around the nation in support of California's magazine ban. Now, the problem is, is that some of these attorneys generals come from, you know, the usual suspect states, states that have already shoved magazine bans down the throats of their citizens. But there is a bunch of other suspects on this list had an opportunity to take a look. A lot of these states do not have magazine bans yet. But why then is your attorney general so vehemently working overtime to make sure that those are found constitutional? Gets you wondering, doesn't it? So today, let's spend a few minutes and let's talk about if you're from one of these states, here comes the magazine bans. Okay, before we get going too far down the road, we're going down. Proud to announce that this video is being brought to you by Security Gun Club. That's right, Washington's premier indoor shooting facility is located right here in Woodenville, Washington. Listen, what I want to talk to you about, though, today is the big event we got going on Sunday, December 10th, right here at the club from noon to four. Now, we're going to be celebrating Washington Gun Law crossing over a quarter million subscribers, but most importantly, we're going to be doing a big, huge toy drive for the Forgotten Children's Fund. So if you got time, come on by. Sunday anytime noon to four price to get in is you got to make a donation for the kids here so once again everything we raise that day is going to go to the forgotten children's fund if you can't bring a toy and you want to just bring a cash donation go ahead and do it remember if you've never shot at the club before you're going to have to come in early and do a safety briefing so please we hope to see all of you here let's help raise a bunch of good toys and money for the forgotten children's fund that's going to be Sunday right here at security gun club noon to four Okay, so the case we're talking about today is Duncan v. Bonta. We've been talking about Duncan v. Bonta for a long time. We've talked about Duncan v. Bonta quite a bit recently. And as we know, the Ninth Circuit full en banc panel has accepted review of that case from the lower court out of San Diego, which inevitably, along with all the other gamesmanship that they've been playing, they will come up with a way to overturn Judge Benitez's decision. Now, the briefs are all being filed in that, and lo and behold, I found this amicus brief brief. Amicus, as you know, it means a friend of the court. It can be called an amicus brief, an amicus brief, amicus curiae. There's lots of different ways to pronounce it, but it basically means is, hey, even though we're not a party to the suit, we'd like to file a brief in support of one of the parties to the suit. It's called a friend of the court. Now, I mentioned in the intro here that this brief was in support of California's magazine ban, and it is authored by multiple attorneys general. But here's the thing. Some of these attorneys generals come from states that don't have magazine bans yet. So what are the states that are responsible for this memorandum? Well, it was authored by the New Jersey Attorney General, which should come as a shock to absolutely nobody. But all of the states listed on this memorandum include Massachusetts, New Jersey, Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, Washington, and Wisconsin. Now, just to give you an idea of where all the AGs are coming from on this thing, they're saying basically, hey, listen, the lower court's ruling, that is Judge Benitez's ruling, needs to be overturned because, well, the Second Amendment does not even apply here. According to the amicus brief, that conclusion should be reversed. Large capacity magazines are not arms under the Second Amendment's plain text because they are neither commonly used nor useful for self-defense and historical understandings of the term arms did not encompass container accessories such as large capacity magazines. Moreover, California's law is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. 
And I know that's got many of you asking, what the hell history books have they been reading? The AGs go on to then further claim to promote our resident safety and well-being. States impose a range of restrictions, including prohibitions on dangerous accessories and weapons not commonly used for self-defense. And this is one of the most disingenuous tricks that we are seeing from those who are supporting civilian disarmament right now, which is they are literally bastardizing the common use test and somehow or another turning it into the common use for self-defense test. But according to these attorney generals, hey, the Second Amendment's not even in the play because their brief specifically states, the Second Amendment does not protect large capacity magazines. That magazines are not bearable arms is more than common sense intuition. As California's linguistics experts explain, historically the term arms was reserved for weapons like blades and firearms. And its meaning did not encompass the separate concept of accessories like cartridge boxes, scabbards, and flint, which were historically considered accoutrements. The same is true for bullet holders like LCMs now. Well, and then of course, if you actually extended that line of thought, would the Second Amendment even protect ammunition then? And of course, we all realize the absurdity of what the AGs are arguing here. Now, they also claim in their memorandum, large capacity magazines are not commonly used for self-defense. Even if this court were to assume that LCMs are arms rather than accoutrements, the Second Amendment does not protect their use for another independent reason. LCMs are not arms in common use for self-defense today, a prerequisite for Second Amendment protection. Okay, so for those of you who geek out on this channel regularly, one, thank you very much, and number two, we have geeked out a lot about the common use test. We've gone through every possible case on it. We've even talked about other judges that have cited to the use of the common use test. Does anyone know where there is the authority to cite us to this in common use for self-defense. Because as much as I geek out on this stuff, I have still not found a case to say that. So if one of you viewers can help us out, put it down in the description box below in the comment section, we would really appreciate it. And then of course, what the attorney generals are arguing here is, hey, listen, even if you believe the second amendment covers this activity, there is a rich historical tradition that allows us to ban these types of things. Why? Well, because we've previously regulated how people can store gunpowder and we've previously regulated Bowie knives. And so therefore that equates to us being able to regulate standard capacity magazines. As the attorney generals put it in their memorandum, California's magazine capacity restriction is analogous to the historical practices and regulating the storage of ammunition and imposing restrictions on new and distinctly dangerous forms of weaponry. And you go, wow, how could that even be a plausible legal theory? Well, the attorney generals explain that because what they're saying is, is listen, when we're talking about historical analogs, we don't just go back to the late 1700s and the early 1800s. No, no, no. Instead, what we get to do is we get to look anywhere in our history book, even in recent years. I'm not making it up. The memorandum specifically states, Bruin and Heller compel the conclusion that courts must consider the broad extent of our country's history, including 19th and 20th centuries when reviewing a state law's constitutionality. What you say? I know, I had that same reaction. And their reasoning behind this is, is that, see, we really just need to analyze all of this under the 14th Amendment, and we can't truly give the 14th Amendment its meaning unless we take a look at all realms of history related to that, including stuff that's happened in the last few years. The Attorney General, put in their brief. This comprehensive approach accords with governing first principles. States are bound to respect the right to keep and bear arms because of the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, not the Second Amendment ratified in 1791. The public understanding of the scope of constitutional rights shared by those who adopted the 14th Amendment must therefore carry significant weight in the historical analysis. And you sit there and you go, oh, really? Well, that's a very unique perspective. And it's a very unique perspective because it helps advance what these attorney generals are trying to argue. Now, there's no basis in it in common sense. There's no basis in it in historical precedent. There's no basis in it in case law or constitutional provisions. But hey, why let that get in the way of your argument? They also point out in their memorandum, 
Furthermore, 20th century history can be uniquely probative in cases involving emergent weapons that did not become widely publicly available until the last century. And so you can see here that they are all over the board trying to create all sorts of new rules of law in common use for self-defense, and that if we're actually gonna analyze this under the 14th Amendment, we really need to take a look at all history, including stuff that just happened a couple of weeks ago. And you take a look at all of the cases that they cite, and they are cases which have upheld recent assault weapon bans, recent magazine bans in jurisdictions such as Washington and Illinois and New York and New Jersey, and even Maryland, a case that was GVR'd by the United States Supreme Court. Listen, this intellectually dishonest approach by all of these attorney generals should be concerning enough, but if you happen to reside in one of the states where your attorney general participated in this amicus brief and you don't yet have magazine bans, you better start carefully watching your state legislature because there is no reason on God's green earth why your attorney general would throw their hat in that ring as a proponent of magazine bans, unless of course your state legislature was planning on implementing magazine bans. The case once again is Duncan v. Bonta. We will link up the memorandum down below in the description box so you can geek out on it for yourself and see all the disingenuous arguments that are being made with your tax dollars. In the meantime, if you got any questions about this or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights, you guys should know how to get a hold of Washington gun law by now. If you don't, that's okay. That information is also right down there in the description box. Now let's everyone remember that part of being a lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.